Welcome back. And now this time we are talking about the Flat Earth Movement. And joining us to talk about this is Mark Sargent. Thank you very much for coming on. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, now, let's let's start out with kind of um, what this is. Um, first of all, maybe describe for the listeners what you think the Earth is, as in shape and, and idea, so that we kind of start with the concept of what we're talking about as a product, you know, how's that? Yeah, I know that's, that's great because a lot of people are going to be listening and going, what in the, what literally, what in the world is he talking about? Yeah. Um, we are talking about literally um, a flat earth slash enclosed world slash enclosed system. Uh, there's various references I'll throw out there. Uh, if you don't know the, the, the movie, the Truman show with Jim Carrey from 1998 or dark city or under the dome, the television series that Steven Spielberg is producing that Stephen King wrote uh, that's, that that's currently running. If you don't know any of those references, then what you're looking at is something really like out, out of the old Testament, Genesis, uh, one six, the firmament, which is, uh, a flat world you know the it isn't a, isn't a sphere it's actually an enclosed system a so you take uh if you, if you take a globe and you put your hand on the north pole and you flatten it like a dinner plate it becomes circular and then you cover it with some sort of you know domish structure and that's really it so the the north pole is at the center of this big dinner plate and the continents spread out organically out towards the edges. And the only thing that really makes it different from a globe in terms of what you're looking at, uh, you know, other than that it's not round, or I'm sorry, spherical, is that Antarctica isn't a continent, uh, because that's the first question. It's like, wouldn't the water fall off the edge? It's like, no, because Antarctica actually goes all the way around. It isn't a continent like Australia with 13 million square miles of ice. It is a... Antarctic coastline that spreads around. The, think of it like a like, like the rim on a dinner plate, all the way around. And and that that part we actually know is true. You know, at least as far as what the Antarctic coastline looks like, and that is it slopes up 200 feet high. It's made out of ice, and then once you get over the top of that thing, it slopes up to almost two miles high, and even higher in some places. So yeah. That's what it looks like. Oh, if you want, if you still haven't figured out the visual, because I know you're listening to radio, if you still haven't figured out the visual of, of it, look at the UN flag, the, the design that was created in 1946. That's pretty much what we look at. The UN flag is identical, give or take. The scale's probably going to be off, because we just don't know the exact scale. But the, the continent layout is pretty much what the Flat Earth map uses, and the United States Geological Survey. And so, um, okay, so we're, we're looking at um, uh, flat and a dome, uh -huh. how thick do you suggest that the, the, the flat Earth is? Oh, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that. Uh, because, all right, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because we don't – I come back with another question. Is like how, how thick do you think the Earth is? Because if you look at mainstream science models, they say, oh, well, it's 4,000 miles down to the, the center of the Earth. And I go, well, that's fantastic. So, you, so you've drilled that far. You have cameras down that far. No. Well, okay, 1,000 miles then? No, hundred miles, ten. The the deepest hole ever drilled is by any corporation, you know, non-military at least publicly in in the world is eight miles. Uh, the Soviets tried for years; they got down to about eight miles. That's twelve kilometers, and they stayed there. They could not get past eight miles for whatever reason. And yet, mainstream science will come back and tell you, you know, we've all seen those cut out, those cross sections of the globe where it goes, you know, from red to orange to yellow to that milky white center. As, and as, where did you come up with that map? It's because mainstream science won't, won't put a question mark in the middle of, of that globe map. So short answer is we don't know how thick it is. We don't know how thick we are, uh, you know, where, where we are now. If I had to take a guess, uh, I'd say it was way less than, uh, you know, the Earth, the, the Earth's thickness, you know, 4,000 miles to the center or 8,000 miles all the way across. Uh, because we can't go down any further than that, which is very suspicious to me. What do you think's on the other side? Wow, that's wide open. <laughs> I, I could be anything, to be honest. It could be, you know, if you're talking about efficiency, because this really leads into some some bigger questions, which is, okay, if this is if this place was created, because if it's flat, then the whole question of intelligent design comes straight to the forefront, which is, okay, if it's flat, that means it was built. If it was built, it was created, and therefore there's your creator. 
uh, if a creator, you know, a divine power or, you know, an advanced civilization, you know, kind of blurring the lines there and the same thing, uh, created this place, they could be another one on the flip side of it. It could be a double-sided coin where you have, uh, you know, an enclosed system on one side and an enclosed system on the other. Wow, that yeah. could be a good movie. That could be good, couldn't it? <laughs> and, and you've got to wonder why it hasn't been made along with any others along this line. Well, and, and so just to just to get the full structure, so the dome, mm-hmm. uh, what's your estimate on how high the dome is up over top of us? That's, that's a tough one because we, you know, the tests that were done uh, from the late, from 1958 till 1962 between the Soviet Union and the United States when they were putting atomic weapons uh, on, on the tips of rockets and firing basically up straight up for four years, we know it's at least 400 kilometers high uh, because that's at least publicly, the, the, the test that they've shown. So if I had to take it, you want, to, you want perspective on this, take like a half dollar, put it on a table, and then take a, a salad bowl, maybe, I don't know, eight inches across glass, put it over the top of it. That's what we're kind of looking at. I don't think it's like a snow globe arc, uh, but it's more like a shallow sports stadium. Uh, you know, art imitates life in this case. Um, it's so maybe, you know, the dome, the top of the dome could be several thousand miles high, uh, then, then of course it raises, and you'll probably end up asking that, you know, what are, where are the sun and the moon coming to this? But it's really a giant, you want another reference? It's a giant planetarium, uh, where you go in, if anyone's been to a planetarium recently, you go up and you look at the stars in the sky. It's sort of shaped like that. That was something I did every year in high school or in elementary school. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. But that, that's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah they're, they're, they're still running out there. You can still find planetariums here and there, but yeah, that's what really what we're looking at. So now, do you believe that the reason I'm getting to this is so now the dome itself, Mm -hmm. is it transparent? Uh, Because we do because you did bring up the sun and the moon and there's also the stars. So at night on a clear sky, you you see what appears to be stars. Yes. So at that point, are the stars real? And as as we think them. And is it a transparent dome, or is this kind of a painted in and its imagery portrayed to it? Uh, the, the latter. I think it's painted in. Uh, I Now, because people said, I, I've got to address several things here. One is because yeah. people say, well, are the stars real? Yes, the stars are real. You know, am I killing astrology? No, I am not. Uh, because, you know, the stars still move across the sky. We can all see that, and the sun and move, move inside, you know, or, around us as well. However, in this sort of system, the star, again, like a planetarium, uh, the stars, the moon, and the sun are just really very, very well-rendered images. Uh, you know, the planets, because people say, well, the planets are round, does that make us round? It's like, well, yeah, they look round, but you got to remember the, the whole point of this illusion is to make us seem like we're in a round uh, or a spherical thing. Uh, the, the only people that show us really, really good pictures of all the planets are NASA, but we'll get into that later. Um, what makes this different, though, than a normal planetarium? Normal planetarium, you know, you can you can show you know moonlight and sunlight and and stars all in one you know system. You can project the whole thing onto the ceiling. But with this, it appears that the sun and the moon are actually three dimensional objects inside this. You know, hanging no different and spinning around uh, no different than a um, a mobile above, above a child's crib where the moon and the sun, you know, again, coincidence that they both appear like they're the same size in the sky, especially when the moon goes in front of the sun, but that they're inside here with us. They may be you know, less than 50 miles across and maybe a few thousand miles high, but the sun is just really one big incandescent light bulb, and the moon is a giant night light. And uh, ask me about that later if you get a chance, because the moon's light properties we found out in the last few months are very, very different than what we've been told. Yeah, that's interesting. So now, and and the other thing I want to cover is before we get into detail is, so we're not a spear Mm -hmm. and we're not doing as we're told. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So what are we doing physically? Oh, you mean like, are we rotating? Are we moving through the galaxy and all that? Spinning? Are we rotating? Are we traveling? Kind of what's your idea of what we're doing physically we're not doing this this answer is gonna kill some listeners that we're not doing anything uh all the motion because you remember the mainstream science will tell you that we you know the earth is spinning at 1100 miles an hour and that it's traveling around the sun at 60,000 miles an hour and that our solar system is moving through the galaxy at like half a million miles an hour or you know depending on what you look it up those numbers vary 
that's a lot of motion happening in a lot of different places. Plus, you get the moon spinning around us, apparently. None of headaches all the time. (laughs) All these things should be happening, but yet uh, the flat model, nothing's happening. The uh, the model's just sitting there. I mean, literally, we could be a planetarium on on somebody's desk or on a much bigger surface. But no, no, again, no different than a planetarium. When you go in there, you're not moving. And the premise of what I put forward, you know, starting uh, last February, February of 2015, was that. What if you could build a planetarium? And I know it's going to sound like something out of the Twilight Zone, very science fiction-y, but, eh, you know, the truth is, is often stranger than fiction. What if you could build a planetarium that, if you, if you had the technology to build one that was thousands of miles wide and hundred, at least hundreds of miles high, how many people could you fool in that system? Let's say they were born into it. Whereas if a planetarium, let's face it, if a planetarium was big enough and you were born into it, you would believe basically anything anybody told you because what, how how could you test this? How would you know? How long could you keep a civilization in the dark, so to speak, from finding out where they really were? And it appears that, you know, in our case, uh, pushing about 5,000 years, give or take. And you get to remember that this, this is also what every tribe, every culture, every religion believed in for thousands of years. It was only 500 years ago that the whole Copernicus... Uh, um, heliocentric model was introduced and then so we've been riding that for the last 500 years and now our technology has reached a point where detection and high-speed internet and hd basically camera technology and high-speed internet and social media ruined the whole thing because now we we, we're comparing notes and as of 2015 this whole thing's starting to break down and I, I, I know I'm kind of downplaying it when I say that, but I'm not kidding. You know, look at, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. When you typed in Flat Earth into YouTube, you just typed in those terms, set no filter, uh, beginning of last year, 2015, you may have gotten maybe 50,000 hits, maybe, relevant, relevant hits. You type that same thing in today, as of like this morning, it's 4.7 million. Is and I, you know, I, yeah, I'm I'm humbled to be a part of it. But all I did was really uh, help create more digestible parts of it. You know, I, for me, it came in as a staticky radio station, and all I did was try to clear up the static. So, so in that case, so we we we've kind of got this down mm-hmm. now. So what's your basis behind it, first of all? So the next question that would come to mind uh, for a listener probably would be, um, so... How do we know? Yeah, 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 sort of. How do we know and who's doing this? Like, um, because um, without without getting into a particular major mainstream religion, mm-hmm. but uh, who would be doing this? You mean hiding it? Yeah. Well, it, uh, from the authority standpoint, and when I say authority, I mean, you know, the combination of, you know, the powers to be, uh, the, the super rich, the royals, and, and the government of, of whatever. But it looks like, if you can imagine this, imagine if this world was eventually supposed to be found out. Eventually, we were supposed to figure out where the edge was and where the ceiling was. And we were supposed to figure out where we lived. And it was supposed to be a natural process. The government of the Soviet Union and the United States seem to have figured it out in about 1956, uh, more specifically during Operation Deep Freeze between 1955 and 1956. And they were the ones that decided, you know what, it'd be too disruptive to civilization, and I won't you know, go into the religions necessarily, but religion would, would play an angle here, because you are talking about intelligent design. And they decide, okay, let's just spend the money, seal off the upper edge and the outer edge, and let's let's see how long we can hide this thing. And so that's that's what we were. You know. So yeah, the United States and Soviet Union last sixty years. If you're looking for the the people responsible for hiding it. So how does that work when we um, get new people in the government? Mm-hmm. Um, so like you know, going from you know, uh, Kennedy all the way up to Obama now. Uh, so, so when they're running for government, you know, like even the people running now, yeah. they don't really know. Most, most people don't. With, with some secrets, you know, I'm not going to go into too many other conspiracies during the show. I mean, everyone knows what yeah. they are. But with most conspiracies, yeah, you might inform people. I mean, even Eisenhower didn't know, for example, that Area 51 was built. 
you know, look into that story. He had to actually force his way in to actually go see the place. So presidents, you don't have to tell them if you don't want to. Uh, Putin might be a different character. But in this case, because it's such a such a big secret, it's really the less less is more. So the less people know, uh, the better. So compartmentalize everything. You don't need so any wrench turners at NASA, anybody that's building building things for satellites, they don't know. Airline pilots, they don't know. Nobody knows because it's too big. You can't. It's so big. It's right in front of your face. I mean, heck, it was right in front of my face 15 years ago, literally staring me in the face, and I couldn't see the uh, the forest for the trees. Uh, I couldn't see it. So, no, no, almost nobody knows. It, you know, your secret societies, and, and take your pick on which, wh- who you want to name on those. Uh, maybe even those at the highest levels, uh, no. But that's, but it's, you've got to be way up on the food chain before okay. you know this thing. And so then what's the, um, what's the point of hiding it? Oh, it, it, would, it would create, okay, what I have learned more than anything about, you know, the rules of power and the authority is, if there's a chance that civilization may grab the torches and the pitchforks and run through the streets and start burning things and killing each other, you're not gonna you're not gonna roll those dice. And that's what I that's what I really stated in the clues. And I'll I'll, I'll go cover them real briefly. And that is, let's say all of a sudden they said, oh yeah, by the way, you're in an enclosed world. Here's the edge, pretty much the handprint of God, uh, and you know that that's really it. let's say the UN announces that tomorrow. Some things, the the wave of what would happen, it wouldn't happen overnight, but the wave of things that would happen would be uh, as follows. First thing would be the education systems would be turned upside down, especially the physical sciences. Everything from high school through the PhD process, you'd have to rewrite so many things. I mean, astrophysics and astronomy, those departments don't even exist anymore. Uh, your remaining physical sciences, geology, hydrology, archaeology, biology, those have to be rewritten from, from the ground up with the new model. Um, the big five religions, you know, uh, Christianity, uh, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Judaism, they all get their holy grail, so to speak, all instantly, overnight. And, you know, there's going to be a backlash against science, which, which would be extremely upsetting. And then the big thing, you know, the, the, the big thing from the individual person, because a lot of people say, well, who cares if it's round or flat? I still got to get to go to my job in the morning, and it sucks. Well, yeah, but now you're going to be driving to your job, and you're going to have this kind of strange feeling that someone's been looking over your shoulder your entire life. And if you want to call it God, if you want to call it, you know, the big eye in the sky, if you want to call it an advanced civilization, whatever, you're going to act differently. And you combine all these things, you know, and, and you look at a boardroom of the powers that be, they're not going to make that call. They, they, they'd think about it for about 10 seconds until they started looking at the stuff I was mentioning. And they say, yeah, we're not. We're not going to do this now. Even in the 50s, it would have been tough to do. So they decide, you know what, we're, we're just going to hide it. We're going to spend the money and hide this thing for as long as humanly possible. And they did. And it worked. It worked very, very well. 60 years. It worked, and now we are um, now we're coming to an end of that. They've had a great run, but uh, it's over. So, uh, do, do you believe that? Um, so, how do all the countries get involved in this, or are they just all kept out of it? Most countries don't even know. Uh, I think at the highest levels, because why would they? Um, any country that's tied, it's not even the countries that matter. Uh, it would be com- things like uh, oil companies. Because you remember the Antarctic Treaty, which was put in place in 1959, that sealed off all countries from doing any corporate work down there for all time. You know, it's the longest running treaty in, in history. Nobody knows about it. You can look it up. It's on Wiki. Uh, and and not only are they not allowed to go down there, but they're not even allowed to talk about it. So, it, which, even though Admiral Byrd went on television in 1954, and said, oh yeah, the place is made out of money. It's got oil, it's got coal, and uranium, and minerals. And all the countries that were rebuilding from World War II wanted to get in there. And then they just sealed it off. Just sealed it off entirely. So no corporation. So if you're, you're the head of Exxon, and you want to go down there, not only can you not go down there to do any oil work, you're not even allowed to lobby for it. And that's, that's, that, was one of, that was my big turning point for me, which was, well, how is that even possible? Money is the backstage pass for everything. And, you know, I'd, I'd, you know you're not even allowed to, to run an ad in the New York Times saying how great it is for Exxon to go to Antarctica. You know, you, you can't tell me the U.N. has that much power. They don't. Uh, you know, you could, they want to start fracking in your backyard, in your neighborhood. They can do that. They can get into national parks. And they aren't allowed to go down there. So, yeah. 
So now let's talk about some of the um, things that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. And what I'm what I'm thinking of is, first of all, like um, you mentioned, um, uh, pilots. Mm -hmm. So now now flight and flight patterns and, yep. and airplanes. So now I take a plane to Hawaii, and then from Hawaii I want to go to, uh, uh, you know, who knows? Buena, so, Buenos Aires or Rio. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so how, does, how does it work that the pilots do not realize that um, what we're dealing with as in a flat rather than spherical world? Well, yeah, that's several reasons. And I've talked to several because I've been, I've been trying to find subject matter experts for the last six months and have found quite a few, including a flight instructor out of Iowa and United States Air Force officer, retired, who was a career navigator. Uh, and the big thing they tell me, because a lot of people say, well, you know, aren't the pilots in on it? Why, well, you know, wouldn't the pilots notice? Like, no, because pilots, you know, if you've ever flown with it, when they own, if you have any pilots as personal friends, they're busy. You know, by, between the time they take off and the time they land, they're checking a lot of things. And when they're not checking a lot of things, most of the time they're relying on autopilot. Autopilot relies on the GPS, otherwise known as the Global Positioning System. And the GPS was designed by the United States Department of Defense. So... And which, and again, the, the don't think for a second the GPS system isn't in on this. Part of the GPS system's job is to keep people from going in certain directions where they're not supposed to be going. Uh, so they no, they don't notice when things go get really weird in the southern hemisphere. And by that, I mean flight routes. Look it up when you get a chance. Flight routes in the southern hemisphere make very little sense. So if you're flying, especially southern hemisphere, uh, south to south. So if you're going from, like, say, Rio to Sydney, uh, you know, you, first off, when you, you try to look for nonstops, there'll be 50 connecting flights and maybe one nonstop. Maybe. There's like five nonstops in the entire Southern Hemisphere from anywhere to anywhere, and, and that's, it's incredible. But the, but the routes are all over the place. That's how I first got into this. I tried to debunk this thing for nine months where, because somebody said the routes are wrong, and the routes only make sense if the Earth is flat, but the Earth cannot be flat. And then the more I try to debunk this, again, try, look at look for yourself. And I'm not going to give you too many examples because I know that the show only runs so long. But look up, try to f book a flight from anywhere in South America to anywhere near Australia and see where the planes go. Don't just look at, just say, don't just say, oh yeah, there's double connection and a triple connection. Look where those connections go. They go way up north. Why it's a flight from Rio to Sydney going through Los Angeles or Dallas or San Francisco or the Middle East? The, the 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 cost of fuel, the price of fuel per pound is what el the airlines base their profit margins on. You can't say you're picking up people, you know, it, not not for those sort of routes. When you when you look at the routes and then you put it on top of the flat map, which is also by the way called if you want to look it up, it's called the azimuthal equidistant map, which is A Z I M U T H A L equidistant map. They straighten out, so these weird, exaggerated curves on a globe all of a sudden become shallow dog legs, or in many cases, straight lines. How does how is that even? That's that's the odds of that happening are extremely remote. But then uh, that brings to the question of uh, then wouldn't the pilots question that in themselves? And w what about the airlines themselves? Well, uh, it, it, good good point. Which is. Uh, if you're a pilot, and I, and I talked about this with the pilots, if you're a pilot, you remember, pilot, it takes a long time to be a pilot, especially in the commercial airline world. And, you, you know, you've got to stay squeaky clean as far as what you say and what you do. But more than that, this is such a huge leap of faith. This whole concept is so far down in the checklist. So let's say you're a pilot, and you're curious, and you're bored, and you're looking through the maps and the charts, and you're going, eh, this is fine, but the fuel consumption seems wrong, and the distances seem wrong, and really the route seems wrong, and why does GPS drop off in those three oceans entirely when you get out over water? If you go down your list of things that you're, you're, you're curious about, are you really going to get to the point where you're going to say, you know what, the map's wrong. And if the map's wrong, the only way the map could be right is if it's flat. Even if you came to that conclusion, if you're a pilot, because again, I'm, I'm never going to say the pilots are in, are in on it because they're not. If you were a pilot and said that, who are you going to tell? Who Are you going to go to the airline? Are you going to go to, to your supervisor? Are you going to go to the head of United? Who, who are you going to tell that you think the Earth is flat? Because if you go and do that, you're not a pilot anymore. You, you, you might as well tell people uh, that you were chased by a giant UFO for two hours. 
and, and make a full public report. We all know what happens to those guys. If you're a pilot and you report a UFO and go on record and say there's a UFO, you're benched. You have an office job for the rest of your career if you even have a career anymore. You will never fly again. Uh, flat, world, flat Earth, pfft. At that point, not only will they will they <laughs> kick you out of the company, they'll probably send you in for a psychological evaluation, because it seems like the most ridiculous concept in the world. And so, what about the satellites and the GPS? Hmm. Um, or do they really exist then? Well, I gotta come back with another question, and I, I don't mean to insult any of the listeners that are out there, but. Who told you there were satellites to begin with? Uh, the same people that told you we went to the moon six times and never had any problems? Went through the Van Allen radiation belts and nobody got died of radiation poisoning? Nobody got radiation sickness? The capsules were never contaminated? And they don't tell you what shielding they used? Because there's only two types of shielding you really use for radiation. One is lead, which we all wear at the dentist's office, and the other is gold. They won't talk about it. Uh, it's, it's, so it, you've got to abandon everything, unfortunately, uh, which is why it makes so many people really upset. There's probably listeners out there banging, you know, their fists on the on, on wherever they are at the radio because they can't believe what they're hearing. But it's true. You've got to give it all up. I mean, if it, if you want to take it in stages, fine. But you're going to have to look at the moon mission first, look at the ISS second, and then look at satellites last. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, I'm, what I'm seeing, I'm going so far as to say that the entire NASA program from 1958 up until today, the airing of this broadcast, the entire purpose that NASA was created was to hide the world you live in. And they've done an admirable, admirable job in some ways, but other ways, you know, they're limited to the age of the special effects. If you have any doubt of that, look at the Apollo, uh, you know, look, there's so many documentaries on what happened with the moon. Uh, I, I, I don't want to get into those. Well, um, so then when we bring NASA into this, yes. um, so we're basically saying that um, they've been the, uh, you know, the, the master manipulators. The, so gate, the gatekeepers, yeah. Yeah. So so does that mean the whole team is involved? Uh, like how, because uh, to put together the projects, like when you were bringing up, first of all, let's say the um, flights to the moon. Yeah. Uh, way back. Yeah. And, and uh, how did they get away with doing that like i it's it's not like and i get that question quite a bit it's not like if this is different this conspiracy is different from any other conspiracy that you've ever heard of which is ironic because it's also the oldest it's it's the one that everybody's heard of lots of people would be like sandy hook what was that but the flat earth that's that's as old as dirt um but it's not like the manhattan project you know where where we kept the atomic weapon program secret uh, you know, that was thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and, and pretty much everybody knew it was going on, and they kept it a secret. Well, I mean, you remember, there was only three television stations back then, and, you know, newspapers, so it's not like things could leak out real easily. You could control media a lot more. But this is different from that, and that is, in this case, you don't need to tell the wrench turners. You don't need, in fact, uh, one of my neighbor, next door neighbor, I used to take care of his cat. Uh, his name, look him up. Uh, his name was Wayne Ottinger, O T T I N G E R. I still get a Christmas card from him. He was like the garage mechanic for NASA. He knew all the Apollo, uh, not only, uh, he knew all the astronauts from Gemini and Mercury and Apollo by a first name basis, talked to him often. And his, pl- his walls were just bristling with plaques. You know, he, he helped design the LEM for the moon and it, the, in fact the, the first design was supposed to be a convertible why they changed it at the last minute we won't get into right now but he knew nothing is what I'm, I'm getting at and that is why and when you look at him it's like why would you tell him anything he was there to do a job he's there to build rockets and build everything associated with rockets he's there to get somebody to the moon if you actually could try to do it and in this case you leave everybody out of the loop except for, I mean, everybody in the control room, everybody on the ground. The only people you really need in are the telemetry guys, the guys that have to create the data that gets sent, supposedly simulated and sent back to Earth uh, from from the program. And and if you, uh, you want a reference to that, look at the movie from, oh, geez, I think it was 1978, uh, Capricorn 1. Look at how that story progressed, and that was there was a, a, a nerd, you know, a, a guy from the control thing that was questioning the data. He's going, this data doesn't seem right. And they ended up, you know, did it off camera, but, you know, that guy was taken care of. He was killed. And those are the guys. That's because anyone that was doing the telemetry, they would have to be in on it. The rest of the NASA, and I mean 99.99% of them, they knew nothing. 
uh, with the exception of the telemetry guys and one other group, and that would have been the astronauts themselves. Uh, the one group of astronauts. Nowadays, I don't think they tell them. That. I mean, yeah, they know they're faking something, but they don't know why they're faking it. I think with the Apollo crew, they told them why. They said, look, you're going to be faking some things, and it's for a really important reason, and here's why. And these guys were true blue Boy Scout heroes. And what, you know, that's why they were so bad. Any, any doubts, had, look up at the international press conference when they came back from Apollo 11. Those guys should have been pumped up on adrenaline for weeks on end. Smiling, I mean, permanent smiles they should have had on their faces. They looked as though all their dogs had been shot. In fact, Neil was, cr- was cracking. He, he was having a hard time even, even getting his sentences out, and he ended up being a recluse. Most of these guys crawled into a bottle or just hid from the public for years and years and years. So anyway, the, point, the short answer, I'm sorry I'm taking so long with some of these, no. is that uh, the astronauts knew. And the and you know for lesser degree the computer guys you know, even though the computers were were much much different back in the sixties and that's it the rest of NASA doesn't know so when people call me and they say my grandpa worked for NASA blah 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 are you calling him a liar I'm going no I'm not calling him a liar he didn't know anything why would he why would you tell a guy like that you want to have as few guys as possible know in fact even some of the guys that probably did know you probably killed not to go into a dark place but you probably did. And um, what about pictures and views from space mm. <laughs> for the Earth? So how, how, how is that? Oh, that's an interesting one. And that was really one of the things that, that got me going on this. Because when I was trying to debunk this thing from uh, like June of 2014 all the way to February of 2015, that's one of the, f- the first things I dug into, which was, okay, this should be easy to debunk because there's obviously a mountain of evidence on the globe site it should i should be able to just go into this box over here and dig up there should be like ten thousand photographs and and thousands of hours of video and all these things and i kept looking and and if anyone wants to look it up don't take my word for it this isn't secret information look it up from 1972 up until june of 2015 there was only one picture of the earth taken you know in full sunlight from space one picture it was Apollo 17, taken in 1972. We've all seen it in the textbook. It shows the bottom part of Africa and all of Antarctica. It's no coincidence there. A lot of clouds, a big crescent cloud shape on it, and that was the one that they that they milked for 43 years. Uh, and when I said I uh, this was square in my face uh, 15 years ago, well, now 16, in um, the year 2000, I was trying to find pictures of Earth to put on. Uh, I was running a tech support department for this company, and I wanted to put them all the monitors. I wanted to put different pictures of Earth. And when I did the, the, the online search, I literally only saw one image. And I don't mean like nowadays where you can see Google Earth images and other, you know, other composites. I mean literally it was the same picture, just in different resolutions and different shading over and over and over. That was the only picture they had. And so there should be 10,000, 20,000, unlimited, uncountable amount of pictures of the Earth from space. There's only one. And as far as video of the Earth from space, there's zero. There's, there's not from, a, and then people say, well, we see the ISS footage. I'm going, no, 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 no. I mean the full Earth rotating on its axis from space. The only one they even for briefly laid claim to was the uh, uh, 1990 uh, Galileo footage which was dissected almost immediately, uh, in fact, recently by a flat earth guy, would, would, you, you watch the 24 hour spinning of it and the weather didn't move. The weather didn't morph or change at all in 24 hours. And you're looking, that's not even possible in 24 hours, even though they time stamped it. Uh, everything from the, and, and so it, and everything you see now, if, if it came anywhere after, you know, 2014, I don't, I don't even consider it valid because it's all response to what we've been putting out there. We were the ones that said, where are the pictures of the Earth from space? And then June, they produced one, the second blue marble shot. The White House tweeted it. Neil deGrasse Tyson tweeted it. And it's, okay, it's nothing but a whole bunch of clouds. It's even worse than the first one that you took in 1972. So uh, I could go on and on, but you see yeah. where I'm going. Here. Well, what about, okay, so when we get into the moon and the sun. Yeah. And first of all, with the moon, for instance, um, what about the things of the Earth having a shadow on the moon and there's, you know, film of that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Make no mistake. That goes along with when I say you have to throw away everything. you got to throw away everything, meaning uh, not just the shadow. How about the blood moon? And that is the blood moon is impossible. The shadow is impossible on a flat Earth because technically there is no 
Earth between the sun and the moon on a flat Earth. The sun and the moon are, are right across from each other. Therefore, whatever images you see must be artificial. And if you think I'm kidding, or you think that's really weird and mind-blowing, look up two things on the internet when you get a chance. The first one's lunar waves. You just type that in anywhere, you will find it. There, there's a whole bunch of hits on that where there seems to be a resolution issue, a refresh rate issue, like a vertical hold issue on the moon that we've only been able to detect with high-definition de- uh, uh, high cameras recently. And then the second one you got to look up when you get a chance is uh, um, moonlight is colder. And I don't mean, because everyone listens, they go, well, of course, it's colder at night. It's like, no, 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 no. The moonlight is actually generating some sort of refrigeration radiation. Meaning, uh, when you, everybody knows if it's 100 degrees in the sun, it's 90 degrees in the shade. You're down in a hot place, you know this. Uh, Because the shade, you know, whatever it is, is blocking some of the sun's radiation. But when you do the same thing in moonlight, and you can use digital thermometers, they're easy to find. You point it uh, in something, an object in the moonlight, and let's say it's 50 degrees. You point it at an identical object in the moon shade, and it's 60 degrees. And it's like, well, that's that's impossible. It can't be warmer in the shade because the sun or the moon is is reflecting some of the sun's radiation. At the very least, it should be, you know, a little bit warmer in the moonlight or even neutral. But we've seen stuff, it's already on, on video where it's up to 12 degrees colder. Uh, that's not possible unless the moon is self-illuminated, which it is. It's it, Not to rip out too much from scripture, but it, yeah, the sun is its own light. The moon is its own light. Uh, the, the moon doesn't reflect anything, which, of course, lends to the question, okay, if the moon is self-illuminated and it's like a big glowing nightlight, what exactly did we land on? Because we land on some dirty gray surface and it wasn't glowing as far as I can tell. Uh, so no, uh, yeah, the moon and the sun are, are completely self, you know, they're their own entities, and they're much, much smaller and much, much closer. So they're not really, uh, so they're not rotating, so to speak. No, but they could be instanced, meaning, uh, well, the sun you don't have to do anything with because it's so bright and nobody, you know, looks at it and photography is is really limited. But with the moon... Uh, whatever it's displaying at seems to be not only is it displaying its own image. You know, I, I believe there's a structure underneath the moon. Whatever it's displaying, um, you know, it is what, what you see it is, but there's something underneath it, and we don't know what it is. But I also think it's also displaying per region, which we've been able only, you know, in the last 15 years or so to do in software, which is you can show, you know, because some people say, well, you know, the moon is, is, is oriented, is rotated one way, but if you go down into the southern hemisphere, it's rotated another way. I'm going, yeah, it's probably because it's instanced, meaning um, you, you can change the moon's display properties depending on where you are. Okay, now <laughs> let's go to um, curvature. Of curvature, the Earth. yep. And so when you're, you know, out on sea and you're looking out at another ship, yeah. on the horizon, it tends to be um, like the lower part of the boat's usually missing or something, and they say that's obscured due to the um, curvature of the Earth. Curvature of the yeah. Earth. So, uh, how, do, how do we go with that? Should be. Uh, and and I would have I would have been right there with you, you know, a few years ago. Again, anyone... And I'm, I'm, there's no way I'm going to convince the listener in just this short show. Uh, anyone that doesn't laugh at this thing right away, it doesn't roll their eyes and, and ridicule it in some way. If you're not doing, if you're not making fun of this thing right away, then there's probably something wrong with you, because everyone's reaction is the same. What the curvature is a perfect question that, that ties into that, and it's like, oh well, we all know that the boats drop off into the into the distance, don't we? Well, we thought that until the new HD cameras came out. And that wasn't really true because what we were watching was it's like okay, you you watch a boat in you know with your naked eyes and you watch it go out uh, to to a certain distance and it seems like it's gone. You 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 look as far as you can and it and it, apparently it, it disappears. And then you take your HD camera, you know, like the the cool Pix nine hundred or whatever the thing is with that really insane zoom on it, and you zoom in and oh, there's the ship again. And so you you leave it, you don't zoom in all the way, and the ship goes off in the distance again. And then you take it, you crank up the zoom, and you can bring the ship back. And you can do this almost infinitely until, you know, the atmosphere starts distorting everything. But the point is, once it gets out to a certain distance, it shouldn't be viewable anymore. Meaning, for, you know, once the ship gets out at, you know, and it's supposed to, everyone doesn't know what the curve is, it's 8 inches per mile squared. So it's not 8 inches per mile, so it's not like, you know, 8 and then 16 and then um, uh, 24 and then 32. It is... Eight inches times every mile times itself. 
So, like, at 2 miles, it's 2 times 2, which is 4 times 8 is 32. 3 is 3 times 3 is 9 times 8 is 72. So, when a boat gets out to a certain distance, you shouldn't be able to see it anymore. Meaning, uh, if it gets out, like, 15, 20 miles, it should be hundreds of feet below the curvature of the Earth. Meaning, meaning on the other side of the hill, because you're basically looking over a giant hill. But yet, there it is. There's the boat, and then we see it with solid structures all the time. Look at the um, uh, look up online if you get a chance. Time lapse of Chicago from the other side of the lake. That's 52 miles. That's almost 1,700 feet. And yet, here's a full 18-hour time lapse of the Chicago skyline. You know, a snapshot. I, I you know, because people's taking snapshots, and they say, you know, people, media have mainstream media said, oh, no, that's a mirage. I'm going really, because what's the time lapse doing? Because that's 18 hours of mirage, and the, case, the the camera is stationary, and it goes into nighttime. It goes through several weather conditions. The thing never blurs. It doesn't go inverted. The Chicago skyline's right there, 52 miles. You should not be able to see it. And uh, so no, you know the boat's going to the horizon. Yeah, you you show me one, and I everyone's got this one, which is really interesting. It's like a three-masted pirate ship. For every one of those, I've got ten of cargo ships and and super tankers that go off into the distance. And they're pulling them right back, and those ships should be gone. So now, <laughs> how do, how do you deal with the um, the public? Um, you know, people like uh, what's been out lately, uh, some of the, uh, like, B.O.B. and then... Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, and, and kind of like their, their little thing and stuff back and forth in the public. Yeah. I, how, do you, how do you perceive that? Well, it's interesting because we were kind of predicting this anyway because we knew there were a lot of closet flat earthers out there that were listening to the concept because it has resonated extremely well, way more than I thought it would be. And it, what happened was there's a lot of people out there that, uh, that know, but they don't know who to talk to about it. It's like, who, who do you talk to about? You, don't, you can't tell just by walking down the street who, who believes this and who doesn't. So some people have actually stuck their neck out there. Um, and when Tila Tequila did it, we kind of saw it as like maybe an anomaly. It's like, okay, all right, that's fine. But when B.O.B. released that song, and called out Neil deGrasse Tyson, and actually used Neil deGrasse Tyson's soundbite in the song, uh, that's when it got really, really interesting. And yeah, the Neil deGrasse Tyson comes out and, and makes his own, right. He, you know, he didn't sing where, you know, his nephew made a song and Neil deGrasse actually r- read some quotes in it. And then Neil deGrasse Tyson goes on uh, national television and the, you know, this, this thing and, and every ma- major media, uh, outlet covered it. Everybody from time magazine to NPR to Esquire covered this thing, but we saw it as kind of like one, what we saw was inevitable. Because there's there's too many people that that are talking about this, and now we see it as okay. The the subject's been broached, and we're kind of waiting for this next person, whoever the next person's going to be. Because if some if once that you know uh, the old military saying that uh, first time is happenstance, second time is uh, coincidence, third time's enemy action. If a third person comes out, then the media has to look at it in a in a different light, which is okay. Why are we still talking about it? It was kind of funny when when Neil deGrasse Tyson and VOB were doing this thing, but why are we still talking about this? Uh, and that's when the media will have to dig into the backstory, kind of what you're doing, and really take a hard look at it. And at that point, well, then it's it's, it's up for grabs what happens next, because yeah, then civilization does change. Um, so, have you ever um, tackled the, um, the the idea of, of the um polarization and you know the north and south and uh you mean like the compasses yeah and rotation periods and stuff like that sure yeah how do you how do you kind of respond to what they say then well when it comes to one the north pole it's interesting because i've got a guy uh who's going to come on i'm going to be interviewing him pretty soon which who says that uh uh the south pole you know because i actually got a question they said when, how far south do you have to go before the South Pole takes over the needle on a compass? And this guy's going to come out and say, because he worked almost exclusively down in the Southern Hemisphere, and he, he, he goes, it never, it never flips. It's always the north. North is always the, the, the side that, that carries it. Uh, but as far as the, you know, as far as the polarization, there's a couple of things you got to look at. Um, one is, you know, does the north, does the magnetic north move? Uh, yes, yes, it does. It does move. Uh, we've we've already shown that it does. Does that mean it's a stationary North Pole? Well, I mean, there may be um, part of the magnetic systems at the very North Pole, but if this thing is all mechanical, 
And by that, I mean you're basically living in a big Hollywood backlot machine, uh, you know, very, very big and very elaborate. Then the magnetic forces, you know, what is gravity and what is magnetism is also part of a mechanical system that's underneath you. And as far as what happens out in the south, don't know. We're still we're still working on it, uh, but we can tell you it's not it's not what it, everyone in mainstream science is advertising it. When do you think that they first realized that we weren't round, so to speak? I think I think the secret societies uh, again. You know, take your take your pick on. You know, that's a dealer's choice on that one. I think they knew for a long time, uh, you know, centuries. But until you have the technology to exploit it. What do you do with that information? Let's say you're the the, the king of France in 1500, right? You have a map that shows the the true map of the world. It looks sort of like a UN thing or whatever it looks like. It's it's definitely not a globe. Um, do you what do you do with that information? Because you've got wooden ships, you know, balloons to carry people weren't even invented until the 1700s. Plane flight's not going to be for another 400 years. Uh, and even then, it's not very good. So what do you do with it? You don't do anything with it. You just kind of bide your time and and keep that in your back pocket. And they didn't they didn't even know for sure, because that's why Admiral Byrd, Richard E. Byrd, was looking for it from 1927 to 1928, all the way until his death in 1957. That's what he was looking for. And so they didn't they weren't even sure. And then I think they almost gave up in 1954 when they let him go on television. <laughs> and say, yeah, Antarctica is just made out of money. Let's just go make money. And then, of course, Murphy's Law says, as soon as he says that, then they find it the very next year. So they only, I think the secret societies knew for hundreds of years, but they only knew for sure in uh, 1956. And so now, what about the seasons? Mm-hmm. And uh, How do they how, work? Yeah, how do they work then? If we're not on an axis and a sphere kind mm-hmm. of going around... The sun and the moon, in that case, do not, they don't take the same path. So if anyone knows the yin-yang symbol, if you laid that on top of a dinner plate, that would actually represent the sun and the moon. But like a, like a record needle on a record, you know, where the grooves, as, as the song progresses, it goes further into the record. That's what the sun and the moon path do. They don't travel in the exact same circular path every time. So sometimes they travel further out. Uh, you know, at a wider radius, and sometimes they, they zoom in closer to the North Pole. You combine that with the, all the other systems, again, purely mechanical, you know, the uh, the jet stream above, the underwater conveyor system, the magma system, uh, you know, can, uh, tinker with those a few uh, few notches, and there's your seasons for you. So now, if things are as you say, mm-hmm. um, where do you see this going? Well, at... Right now, it looks like it's going to go to some form form of disclosure. Uh, the mass media didn't have to cover it. You know, if you believe in conspiracies and, and that nothing in the mass media happens by accident, then yeah, there's some ulterior motive here, and it seems to be part of a bigger revelation. And we're still trying to figure out what that is. Uh, so flat Earth, you know, yeah, it seems like a very very big concept, and it is. Uh, and everybody found out about it. It would be an amazing thing. But we think it's part of something else. So we think that uh, Flat Earth is going to be revealed eventually or discovered or falsely discovered, whatever you want to call it. And then that will be part of something bigger. Let me take it one step further. And that is the builders of this place wanted us to figure it out eventually. But it was delayed somewhat. Uh, by that I mean, I think we were supposed to find it naturally, maybe as late as the 1970s, you know, maybe by a private explore, exploration team, a private rocket company, whatever you want to uh, take your pick. But that was delayed because the powers that be that figured it out had the ability to cover it up for for a long time, well, relatively long time. And so once, I, I think it's going to be part of the 100th monkey effect, if you know what that is. And that is, once enough people figure it out, that will trigger a mechanism that basically sounds the uh, the alarm bells and the builders show up again. <laughs> it's, again, sounds sounds pretty wild and far out, but that's, if that's how I, if that's that's the storyline that, uh, uh, if I had to write something on this, a book, that's, that's where I'd go with it. And so, um, the question of what are you going to say to the people that have been abducted by aliens? Mm. 
Well, I think they very well were abducted by aliens, but I don't think those aliens were from other planets. Uh, in fact, I've got a debate coming up with, um, I think, Richard Hoagland tomorrow, which oh. I know, that, that ought to be interesting. Well, because, yeah. <laughs> because I, for this, this enclosed world model changes everything from that standpoint. So there is no solar system that you know of. Uh, there is no universe with billions and billions of light years and things that are super far away and distances that don't make sense. It's all way more efficient and, and way more compact. So... Yeah, are there spaceships flying around there? Yeah, you bet there are. I've watched them with night vision many times for years. Uh, get some night vision binoculars. Go out there yourself. It's The sky just lights up. It's like a traffic jam sometimes. Uh, and you think they're satellites until you start seeing them do weird uh, ballistic motions that you never see in a, in a satellite. But what I'm getting is I don't think we're also the, the first civilization or the only civilization to live in this place. I think there are other civilizations that have been here before us and have been talked about in myths and legends, and there are survivors of those civilizations, that, and they have rules to follow. So, you know, they could, they could be in here with us. They could be in other enclosed worlds just on the outside of this place. But, but yeah, they interact with us. But at the same time, they don't uh, do the things that, you know, the, the old question of that is, well, if there's aliens, why hasn't one landed on the White House lawn? And the answer is, well, because it would change too many things if they did. So, yeah, you want to pick off somebody in a boat in the middle of nowhere or a forest or something like that and abduct people, do whatever, and put them back? Sure. Sure. But it's not breaking the rules officially. I think it's kind of a cheat. Uh, but, yeah, I have no doubt that, that, that people have uh, dealt with some strange things out there. So what's next for you? Like, um, what's next on your <laughs> movement? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, this one we're just kind of uh, we're we're kind of along for the ride. I mean, this thing's only been going for a year. Uh, my my Flat Earth Clues series is only a year old. Um, it was it, it hit its year anniversary last week. So we're um, there's a there's a radio show. There's been feelers from different producers out there, uh, but the first thing is probably going to be a radio show uh, a, a, that uh, is going to be a dedicated radio show for this. And then as far as everybody else that's going, you know, there's so many people in it. I, we don't know. We're just kind of, we're just kind of going with it. There's so many people that have joined and that are so enthusiastic and they're making their own videos and, and it's trending. And once that thing, once it hit mainstream, we, we, we don't know where it's going. We're just trying to hang on and, uh, and, and trying to roll with it as best we can. So for me, I, I'm just going to keep spreading the word. You know, making videos, doing shows. I've got my own show where I interview people, um, doing as many interviews as I can, just spreading the word, and and see see what good things entail. Okay, let's give out your contact information. So, <laughs> how do people get a hold of you, and um, maybe give your website? Sure, sure. The, yeah. the the official website is enclosedworld.com. The YouTube channel is Mark M A R K and then another K, and then S-A-R-G-E-N-T, but you don't have to remember that. You can just type in Flat Earth Clues into any search engine, and eventually you will find me. Uh, and then my email address, which I put at the end of every email, and I know I put my phone number at the end of every email, email I'm sorry, at end of every video, but the email address is M as in Mark, so it's M Sargent S-A-R-G-E-N-T, 23 at Comcast.net. Fantastic. Um, well, thanks very much for... Um giving us your information thank you very very much for having me okay how do you like that it was great yeah yeah, yeah so yeah. i i hope you don't get it. i don't know what your forums are like but uh if they're like anybody else's uh you will you'll get some people that are gonna be i yeah i don't uh, i don't i don't care what okay no no